Okay. And enjoy me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Chairman McKinney? Here. Councillor Backer? Present. Councillor Dill? Here. Councillor Lennon? Here. Councillor Lynch? Here. Councillor Rowe? Here. Councillor Swift Kayada? Here. Manager McGovern? Here. Okay. First item is uh, minutes of the meeting 2 2007, held January 8, 2007. We have a motion to accept the minutes. So moved. Second. Okay. Any uh, discussion? Ann. Yes, I have an, um, something I think needs to be changed on page five on item number 31-2007. Uh, right after where it says the motion and then the second and then it said vote 7-0 then comments Councillor Swift Kayata the last line of that it's um, it this is the one just for anybody who might be watching it has to do with the PSAP uh, discussion and our uh, working together with South Portland um, where it pertains to my comments here it says she also wanted to make aware the costs of this program I'd like to amend that to say she also wanted to make everyone aware of the costs of this program and that there were not no local dollar savings anticipated because that was the point I was trying to make mm -hmm. any other amendments or comments just uh, just a matter of wording on item 28-2007 um, appointments chairman count uh, appointments chairman councillor swift Kayata wanted uh, wanted to recommend the I think it just should be recommended the appointments of Randy Clark yes mm -hmm. okay. is that it <clears throat> Okay, all in favor of accepting the amended minutes? Okay. Super. Okay, reports and correspondence. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on Wednesday, January 24th, I represented the town council uh, at the first meeting of the fire department future direction planning meeting. Uh, this was to discuss and explore manpower deployment challenges in a volunteer slash call uh, fire and rescue service like we have here in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, future meetings will address options which we may need to consider at some point if and when we reach a point where uh, strict volunteer call service uh, is no longer viable in town. So I'll keep you posted. I'll be attending future meetings. Any other reports or correspondence? Cynthia? Yes, I just have two points um, to make. Um, one is that um, I was um, happy to suggest to the Maine legislature when a proposed joint rule concerning the states complying with the LD1 spending limits failed, um, I suggested to the, um, the legislature that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council had pledged in the past to adhere to a spending cap and that. Uh, that might be an alternative to a proposed joint rule and um, it passed the joint resolution to adhere to the state spending cap under LD1 passed unanimously so I just uh, thought that the people of Cape Elizabeth might like to know that, um, that their town council is uh, <laughs> um, the, um, the impetus to that and, and I think that's a good thing and then second thing I'd just like to recognize the Cape Elizabeth School Board who um, actively took a part in the um, hearing on February 5th regarding the school consolidation and reform bills that are currently before um, the legislature for consideration and I was um, pleased to be there with them and I just want to recognize the hard work that they've done and continue to do um, on all of our behalf. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, 
a couple of different things. I just wanted to um, make everyone aware that the comprehensive plan uh, committee is winding down its work. Councillor Lynch and I have been on that committee, and uh, the group will be delivering its report to the council at the very end of February. So that's one thing. Um, secondly, I wanted to thank um, Becky Swift and Tom Eismeyer at Pond Cove. Um, a number of counselors, including myself, visited Pond Cove a few weeks ago to learn more about school programs and what goes on there. And it had been a while since my kids were little enough to be at Pond Cove. So it was, it was very illuminating. And I just wanted to thank them for their efforts in um, trying to orient us a little more. Um, thirdly, I'd like to thank Deborah Lane, who ran, um, who prepared, was unable to attend, but who uh, prepared and put together uh, everything for the boards and commissions orientation at the end of January. She did a great job in pulling it all together. It was well attended by members of boards and commissions in town, especially newer members, but there were a lot of people there who um, had already been on boards and commissions. So that was a successful event. And lastly, um, I saw Jim Rowe and um, a number of other people, a bunch of citizens, uh, at the DOT public hearing about um, the project that's happening on Spurwink Road. That was early, when was that? Last week. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, was, it was pretty impressive. They had the whole road laid out on a map right along the railing here, and they, they showed uh, citizens what was going to be happen happening there. And Bob Malley did a good job of pulling that together, as did the DOT people. So I, I know Jim and I found it very helpful. So I just wanted to thank them. Anybody else? Jim. I'd like to echo uh, Ann's thanks to the school department for, for the wonderful time we had in going back a few years and attending Pond Cove Elementary School. Um, it was really great to reconnect with old friends. Well, they're not old people. They're, they're friends that I have known for, for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a great experience. And also, uh, uh, Ann and Mary Ann and myself, I'm not sure if any other counselors were at the uh, school's future direction planning meeting. <laughs> Uh, held at the uh, high school on f January 26th. Um, that was a great experience, and, and I hope that the, uh, the school department and school board will achieve some f uh, direction from that meeting. And uh, it was well attended, very productive, and time well spent. Thank you very much. David. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask um, Councillor Dill, if she wouldn't mind just elaborating a little bit more for the benefit of the council and for the town on the pledge of the state legislature and the significance of that, not only on what the anticipated state budget would be this year, but the effect on cities and towns, if any. Um, yes, thank you. Um, well, to elaborate, historically, um, the... Um, Alliance of the Main Municipal Association and the Main Service Association and the Main Chamber, and Anne could identify the other members of that alliance, among other parties, um, were felt strongly that the state should adopt a proposed joint rule, not adopt a proposed joint rule, I'll adopt a joint rule that would bind both the House and the Senate um, to stick within the LD1 spending caps at a state level. And there was discussion and caucus meetings, and an opinion ultimately was rendered by the Attorney General that a proposed rule that would um, mandate a two-thirds vote in both the House and Senate to exceed the LD1 spending caps was unconstitutional. And therefore, um, an informal poll was taken, and the joint rule was going to fail. And um, so that's when I had offered as a suggestion to the House Majority Leader, Hannah Pingree, that, geez, in Cape Elizabeth, what the town councilors did prior to my being on the town council was a pledge um, kind of to head, head off the Pileski referendum, and it seemed to um, be effective <coughs> to a certain extent, and maybe that would be a um, compromise position between uh, the joint rule and what some people's seem to think would be the state's sort of ability just to not comply with the LD1 spending caps. In fact, the state has complied with the LD1 spending caps for the last two years. And from what I know, um, there's no expectation that 
the state would exceed the LD1 spending cap. To answer your question about what it means for towns, um, it doesn't really mean that much <laughs> because towns are still required under LD1 to comply with the spending caps as they are set forth. And so this, the state's res, uh, the legislature's resolution doesn't really have any impact on the town of Cape Elizabeth, but hopefully gives some assurances to some of these other groups um, that, in fact, state legislatures, state legislators are committed to um, staying within the spending caps as set forth in LD1. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. If I could just offer a little more background to that, mm -hmm. um, just to get at the reason why the joint rule change was proposed. The reason is that the coalition that um, Cynthia mentioned of the Maine Education Association, MMA, the Service Center Coalition, and a number of other groups um, have proposed a bill, um, a plan, and uh, to, to affect spending um, and tax burden relief um, in the state. And the proposed bill says that to um, override, to pass uh, a budget at the local level or the county level, you'd have to have a majority of the legislative body, like the council, and then send it out for a public referendum where you'd have to have a majority vote, or if there were a two-thirds vote of the legislative body, the council, then you wouldn't have to send it out to referendum. The problem comes because this law cannot bind the legislature because the legislature is only bound by the Constitution. They could pass this law and then just ignore it. And the joint rule would, that was proposed would have, in, strangely enough, had the effect of being stricter than the law because the joint rules bind the legislature for this biennium. So um, it didn't work because there was uh, an AG uh, opinion that it could be unconstitutional. But that's the background for, for why the two-thirds um, joint rule was proposed. I hope that clarifies things. It does, very much so. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for permitting me to request that clarification. You're welcome. Yes, Any, no, anything no, else? Thank you. Okay, I, I have two comments to make. One is I would like to uh, commend the Comprehensive uh, Planning Committee, of uh, which uh, Marianne and Ann served. Um, very impressive job. We, we, at the uh, get together we had for the Appointments Commission, uh, there was a presentation that was given, and I think the public will get to see more of this as we move forward. Very, very impressive job. That group put together a ter terrific comprehensive plan over a short period of time, and it covered just about everything. So. And the second uh, comment I would like to make is that um, recently the Greater Portland Council of Governments, uh, the steering committee, met with the county commissioners, and we're working on a way to develop uh, a better working relationship with the county and to make sure we're doing things efficiently and each party or each organization is doing what it does best to um, help with, you know, cost uh, savings and so forth for the region of Cumberland County. So I think that's important for everybody to know that that's actually happening. Okay. Town Manager's report. Yes, thanks, Paul. Uh, a couple of different things. First, there's, there's been a number of questions as to whether or not there'll be a Family Fun Day this year. Uh, the Family Fun Day committee has uh, set it for June 16th. Uh, it will be coming to the Town Council next month for approvals with all the other Fort Williams Park uses that uh, the committee will be re reviewing, I believe, uh, some night this week. But anyway, those that approval will be on your agenda, but the tentative date is June 16th, including fireworks. Uh, the Conservation Commission uh, is hosting on Sunday, March 4th, on Great Pond, a winter festival uh, on the pond itself. It, it's hoped that there may be some ice uh, and some, some other uh, festivities, but uh, they're, they're looking forward to doing it, and uh, they're, they're talking about having grills out there and, I don't know, toasting marshmallows and doing other things that you do at uh, 
winter time on ice. But uh, it sounds like uh, you know a nice activity, and part of it is to you know have citizens, particularly from that immediate area, but throughout, understand the the you know what a, what a great asset Great Pond is. Uh, during the uh, the winter months, also we wanted to know, as the council is aware that I, I was gone for 14 work days uh, during the last month uh, doing different things. But I, I, I want to particularly thank Deborah Lane for her services uh, acting town manager, uh, Matt Sturgis for his services acting town manager, and Neil Williams for his services acting town manager. During the, those 14 days, uh, Deborah Lane was also unexpectedly out, thus necessitating. Uh, uh, three different acting town managers, and uh, I appreciate all their efforts. I also appreciate the support of everyone here in the building, particularly because yeah, I think as you know, everyone's aware the superintendent of schools during this period has also uh, been out uh, having successful heart surgery. And uh, so as a result, you know, we, we didn't have the staff that we're accustomed to have. And everyone has been pitching in terrifically, I know, in the school department, uh, help helping uh, Alan Hawkins in so many different ways, just as everyone has been helping, you know, municipally as well, and uh, you know, I really appreciate everyone's efforts during this period. And and Matt Sturgis actually had to make a difficult decision on Thursday. We had uh, for the new technology offices that the school did down at that point, they're moving into the old the old cafeteria downstairs. They were putting in a new floor, and it, it was nauseous. And we had a couple of employees get sick, and we actually had to he had to close the town office early on uh, Thursday at, at 3 o'clock rather than 4. So the employees were happy, uh, but, you know, and I hope no one was, was inconvenienced, but it, we were concerned about employees' health. And uh, as we, unfortunately, the floor, I just looked at it, is almost totally done, so we're hoping we won't have that problem again. But anyway, uh, really appreciate everyone's uh, efforts while it was gone, and uh, appreciate the council's understanding. Of that. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we move to <coughs> citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Millett. I live at 12 Wombeck Road, and I'm here speaking for you in front of you tonight as a citizen, not as a representative of the school board. Um, as the town council is about to embark later this evening on setting targets for the municipal and school budgets, I would I appreciate the opportunity to share some of my thoughts and concerns with you regarding this process. First, I would like to say that my perspective on this is informed by a professional background in financial analysis and managerial finance and an MBA in finance from the University of Chicago. Um, as I begin my third budget process as a school board member, I have questions about the setting of council targets or caps as it currently is unfolding. I understand from personal experience that targets are used by many organizations and to their advantage. I don't, however, know of any that rely on just a couple of economic indicators, nor using a, measure, a measurement that is antithetical to its work, such as using a consumer price index, which includes clothing, homes, automobiles, etc for an educational service provider where its wages account for 62% of its basket and benefits 14% for a total of 76%. If a target is to be used, then it should reflect a comprehensive calculation of at least a majority of the relevant factors. And I had the opportunity to come up with a very rough analysis of what an alternative price index for a school district would be, or what it would look like. And I was able to actually locate a national average for teacher salaries and benefits, total, comp total compensation, for the 0605 change, and that was 4.2 percent. I also was able to locate a national average for utility costs. So what I did was I weighted the change in teacher compensation by 0.76, which reflects the 76 percent of the total budget. And I weighted something, our debt service, which actually decreases. I weighted utilities, and then I weighted other, which I used the CPI for. And what I ended up with was a number of 3.4 percent. Now, I present that to you not as a hard number, but rather as an illustration that it is possible to develop 
an indicator that perhaps reflects more accurately the economic activity of our school district. In addition, most organizations use both top-down and bottom-up target-setting processes, allowing those with direct line experience to provide pertinent data. I appreciate that counselors are endeavoring to arrive at a data-driven target rather than perhaps relying solely on a CPIU. But I believe the process, <clears throat> the process of counselors emailing questions to the superintendent's office has not allowed for an opportunity, has not allowed an opportunity for administrators to provide information it feels is pertinent to the budget. For example, 70% of the CIP increase, with $139,000, is attributable to a school system upgrade and investment. The questions also lead me to ask, is a target being set or a final number such as a cap? The budget book has yet to be completed by our business manager or presented to the school board. The school board has yet to have asked its questions and make any changes it feels necessary, nor has it voted on the budget and presented it to the, to the council. And yet the questions asked by the council are detailed and in-depth. It seems that the council potentially is coming to a conclusion without a fully informed view. So I hope that at some point the school board and town council can have some constructive conversations as to how to improve this process. And I thank you for your time, attention, and dedication to our town. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there anybody else who would like to um, make any comments on any other items? Okay, we'll move on to item number 34-2007, report from appointments committee regarding vacancies on boards and commissions. Do we have a motion? Ann. Um, yes, I'd like to, uh, as chair of the finance committee, I'd like to recommend the following appointment. Nancy O'Sullivan for the Thomas Memorial Library trustees, and if I could just uh, give a little bit further information. Sure. Uh, David Backer and Marianne Lynch are on the committee with me. I'd also I'd like to thank them, and I'd especially like to thank Deborah Lane, who also has helped facilitate this process. She she staffs that committee. Um, we interviewed a number of people, as you may recall. We had a bunch of appointments last month. These were a few more openings, uh, a few more people that we had to deal with for for one more opening on Thomas Memorial Library. Um, so I would ask that you approve the appointment as presented. We had a number of excellent candidates, but again, there was only one opening for Thomas Memorial Library, and we had a number of people who were interested in it. I uh, want to thank them for their interest, encourage them to apply again, because uh, as probably all of us know and many other people in town know, sometimes it takes several tries before you get onto a committee, especially the popular, the really popular ones like Fort Williams Advisory Commission and Thomas Memorial Library. So please don't be discouraged if you uh, were, were not um, recommended for appointment this time. I wanted to mention one other matter. Uh, we have had another resignation from the Arts Commission. So we now have three openings on the Arts Commission. Um, we have had, however, no applicants for the Arts Commission openings despite re um, advertising uh, a number of times. And the Appointments Committee has discussed uh, this issue and has concluded that um, we, sh we as a finance committee, we the whole council acting as a finance committee should discuss this topic, the future of the Arts Commission and, and what should be done um, with it budget-wise. Uh, during the budget process that's upcoming over the next couple of months. Um, I have discussed with Diane Brakeley, who's a member of the Arts Commission, the former chair, um, uh, this issue, and she said she would discuss it with the remaining other three people on the Arts Commission. They are meeting tomorrow night, and so um, they will be coming, they or at least some of them will be coming to the budget, uh, the Finance Committee meetings, and so we will see we will have an opportunity to discuss with them their recommendations for what we should do and then 
we'll probably be able to make some sort of decision as a finance committee as to what to do with the funding because it does seem to be an ongoing issue with that particular commission so so with that preface I would ask that uh, I'd like to move that um, the council uh, appoint Nancy O'Sullivan I'll second that okay. any discussion all in favor Okay, now we'll move on to item number 35-2007, request for quick claim deed, 145 Mitchell Road, map U34, lot 003. I would move approval to file the quick claim deed um, for 145 Mitchell Road that is in our package. Second Copy of which is in our package. Any, any discussion? All in favor? Just, just a comment on that one. The, the item number on the exhibit, I think, should be corrected to read 35-2007. The, 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 yeah, there was an item that just came off the agenda, okay. the revised agenda. Oh, one, yeah, the, 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 items were, or the, yeah. Or the item. Yeah, we'll correct, correct that. They were moved. In the official record. The, the right numbers, though, were on the sheets originally. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good catch, though, Jim. Okay, now we're at citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Are there any other citizens that would like to uh, speak? Okay. Uh, before we go into executive session, I just have a procedure question. Sure. We are meeting as a finance committee, and I think there are people here who are probably interested in the finance committee but would not be attending the executive session. So my question is, can we adjourn for the time it takes to hold the finance committee and then go back in to the executive session so that those folks can go home? The, the chairman could call a recess of the town council, keep the town council meeting going, and have the workshop at that point. I think that's reasonable. I would suggest we do that in light of the people who are here. OK, we, we will um, take a recess from the council meeting for the time it takes to deal with the finance committee issues. Okay. Can I do that out back? And then we'll, we'll reconvene. But we, we won't reconvene back on the air? <clears throat> uh, no. Okay. We, we will not reconvene back on the air. Thank you. We're not planning to take any action. I hope not. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the public needs to know that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's reasonable. 